Support comes from Thomas Nelson Community College, now becoming Virginia Peninsula Community College, the first choice to start a bachelor's degree since tuition is one-third the cost of four-year schools. More at tncc.edu. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at hamptonroadscf.org. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. It's happened again. Another mass shooting in the city of Norfolk, this time involving students from Norfolk State University. Seven people shot, two people killed. It's the third mass shooting in the Mermaid City this year. So what is going on? Why are we solving disputes with gunfire? What can we do as a community to stop the violence? Some thoughts from our Another View Roundtable pundits, Alvian Lyons, Dawn Hester, Carol Pretlow, and Gaylene Connoyton. Let's have an honest conversation about gun violence. That's next on Another View, right after this national, regional, and local news from NPR and WHRO News. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Um, Before we get started, a couple things happening in the community that I hope will be of interest to you. Uh, New Zion Baptist Church is holding a community health and wellness fair next Saturday, September the 17th. It's from 10 in the morning until 1 in the afternoon, and it is free health screenings and more for men, women, and children children. So come on out. They are located at uh, 3991 Long Hill Road in Williamsburg. That's New Zion Baptist Church Community Health and Wellness Fair. And then the city of Norfolk is celebrating its 10th year. It's Norfolk Neighborhoods Expo, and that's also going to be held on the 17th. Um, It is all about crafting community connections as they celebrate the unique and diverse communities in the city of Norfolk. Uh, It is going to be Saturday, September the 17th from 11 until 3 at Northside Park, which is located at 8400 Tidewater Drive in Norfolk. So come on out and celebrate all of our diverse communities in the city of Norfolk. And then the organization Wesley Community Center Service Center is holding a fundraiser um, with Grammy Award winners Layla Hathaway and Robert Glasper. They're going to perform at the Atlantic Union Bank Pavilion. That's also on the 17th. There's a lot of stuff going on on September 17th. That's at 8 p.m. And the proceeds will be used to raise money for a new education facility, which will house a Head Start program and various community services for Portsmouth and for Hampton Roads residents. So you can get tickets at Ticketmaster if you are interested in that. And then finally, I hope you will join me this Sunday for the uh, Virginia Symphony Orchestra community event. And that is where all the uh, community members come together, bring your instruments, bring your voices, and we all just get together and sing songs and play music and celebrate um, diversity and celebrate each other. That is going to be at 4.30 this coming Sunday, September the 11th at the Half Moon Cruise and Celebration Center. And uh, we haven't been together in two years because of COVID. So we hope that you will come out, join us as we come together to celebrate each other. And I look forward to seeing you there. So between January and June of 2022, 115 people have been shot to death in the seven largest cities of Hampton Roads. Now that doesn't include the number shot, but not fatally. And that number does not take into account those murdered since June. This past weekend, another mass shooting at a house party on Killam Avenue, four women and three men were shot. Two died. One was a nursing student at Norfolk State University. Now, the majority of homicides involve young black men, although increasingly we are hearing more and more about female victims also. So what can we 
collectively as a community do to stop this violence? Let's talk with our Another View Roundtable pundits. Dawn Hester is an educator and a woman who has spent most of her adult life in public service, now serving as the treasurer for the city of Norfolk. Hey, Dawn. How Hello you doing? there. Hey, everyone. Glad to have you with us. Alvian Lyons is Virginia's relationship expert. She's a podcaster and a talk show host <laughs> and all that. <laughs> How are you, Dr. Lyons? I am awesome. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. And joining us on by phone is Gaylene Knoyton. She's a healthcare advocate, political consultant, and the president of the Hampton NAACP. And Gaylene is joining us by phone because she attended the um, Norfolk State University. I mean, I'm sorry, not Norfolk State. She attended Bobby Scott's uh, fundraiser over the weekend, and the congressman, unfortunately, has come down with COVID. So she wanted to be safe and to be sure that we would all be okay. So how are you, Gaylene? I am doing well. I came back um, ne- uh, negative, so I'm good. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> that is great news. And uh, also joining us is Carol Pretlow. She is a political science professor and mentor at Norfolk State University, and she is walking into the studio as we speak. So she'll be joining us in just a moment. So we want to talk about what has been going on, and I'm going to give Carol a a chance to just get settled because I want to talk to her about this first. Let me ask you, though, Alvian, so while she's getting settled, um, what was your reaction when you heard about the shooting, the latest mass shooting? Well, what's even, what was interesting about it is that I, so I got, I get some of the updates because as you guys know, I advise for some of the police departments. So I get the opportunity to find out some information about things that are transpiring and what it is that we can do, need to do, the way we need to communicate that out, uh, what kind of resources we may have in the community that um, may be able to show up, particularly with our faith-based relationships, mm-hmm. right? How do we make sure that at a grassroots level, we are talking to the families where it, a lot of times you know these families you know so um so i had seen that and it always because i have a child that is college age and this happened right by odu i have a daughter who graduated from odu um there's a piece of you that instantly thinks about this could have been my kid Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so that thing never leaves me when we're start when we're talking about 18 to 25 you know my kids are in that age range. People don't normally realize that because I'm only in my mid forties, but we got married so young, <laughs> our babies are older, right? So I so I always think about the fact that and my house was the house where all the kids would come to. You know, oh, like so, so you would hang out. So out. I yeah, we are that house. <laughs> so a lot of times my kids will know somebody, you know, through somebody oh. who may have been, you know, around these kinds of experiences because a lot of them happen in social gatherings. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's not always people always think these are the bad kids. It's not always any of that at all. You could just be hanging out with friends and it's not like you do a background check on everybody and who everybody knows and who everybody's having conflict with and how what kind of conflict conflict resolution skills those people had, you know, yeah. these, it snowballs so quickly. So for a backdrop, I would, uh, that was my first response. Mm-hmm. I happened to go to church that Sunday morning and one of the youth from the church was in tears. I did mm. not find out until after service was over that she had just found out that it was her friend who got shot in the head oh, that was gosh. dead. Mm-hmm. So here we are at church finding out that one of our youth who is super active in church and a Norfolk state student, Mm. it's her own friend who just lost her life, who was absolute good student, never had issues, nothing. And this is what ends up happening. Mm. So we don't realize how close to home this could be. And the thing that is unique that I always consider as a parent of young Brown children, Mm. I always wonder, do White families have to sit down and have these conversations with their kids. How is it that our kids, we can do everything we possibly can, Mm -hmm. but with our kids, we still have to consider where they are, what they're doing. I'm not saying other people don't have to consider those factors. Everybody raising their kids go through those conversations about safety and good Mm -hmm. Mm decision-making. But there seems to be a secondary lens that we have to navigate where youth violence is concerned, that makes a simple gathering with some friends Friends at a house a situation that could be life-changing and permanent. So I don't hear these things through the lens as a professional, 
Mm-hmm. My n- initial response is always as a mom, mm-hmm. you know, like mm-hmm. these are our babies <laughs> that will not be part of the American dream, that will not get the opportunity to contribute to the beautiful trajectory that is possible as a byproduct of new innovation and idea. Mm-hmm. This will not happen as a byproduct of one bullet who could care less who you are that came from one gun exactly. that somebody else did not care about life inside of. I mean, the combination of those things can be absolutely, absolutely. mortifying. Carol, you're on campus. You've got a bunch of students. What are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the situation. And I wish you could have been in my intro to Jewish prudence class. In fact, I told them I want them to call in today because we realize that we have to be proactive. And I have to tell you, I experienced, I don't have a biological child, Mm -hmm. but when I heard this, it, it was devastating. And in fact, I was getting dressed to go out my usual shopping and having a good time. And a friend called and she said, have you heard the news? And I said, no. She said, haven't you heard about the shooting? And no, I said, now I hate to say this, but when she said shooting, I was like, that don't have nothing to do with me and my students. But then she said, turn on TV. And when I did, I really, I have to admit, I cried because to me, I don't have a biological child, but each and every one of those students are my child. So I listened and then I called one of my students who filled me in and I said, oh my God, what are we going to do about this? Mm -hmm. And it was just, it's still devastating. Mm -hmm. And it's also not only devastating to constantly go through this, Mm -hmm. but to also realize that at some point, not just the Norfolk community, but the state and the state legislature and the people who have political control should address this. And of course, the I was thinking, okay, now our governor is going to pitch in and he's going to tell us something. Mm-hmm. I waited all day, clicked on back and forth. Sunday, clicked on back and forth, nothing. Went back to school on Tuesday, asked students what they had heard, had any messages come directly from the governor. And actually, we sat in class and it was almost like having um, a burial service that was productive in here is how, what we have to do to protect ourselves. Now, on another level, and I don't want to monopolize this, mm-hmm. I thought, wow, I could have been there. Because students, a lot of times when they're having parties, and stuff, Prelo, can you, you want to come? <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to be your grandmother. Of course I'm not going to. No, but you can come. This going to be fun. And I said, wow, suppose I had actually been there. Yeah. And would I have made any difference? Would I have been able to stop this? When things happen to us, but not from us, it's nothing we can do unless the other, the more expansive community chips in. Mm -hmm. And if I sound angry, yeah, I am. Because we go through this over and over and over. And even some students yesterday in class said, Ms. Pelo, you're upset, but the reality is, oh, the media is going to cover this and then people are going to be upset and we're going to cry. And, and then two months from now, they're going to be forgetting it. And I said, not this mm. time. Mm. Not this time. And, that, and that's why we're, in our conversation today, we really want to talk about trying to get down to some solutions. But let me hear from you, Gaylene, um, your reaction. Well, my reaction is I always say that gun violence is a public health crisis, mm-hmm. and uh, and we and until we address it as a public health crisis, um, it's, we're going to still have these issues. I mean, it's a, I, I look at it as a domino effect. What's mm-hmm. going on in our communities with mm-hmm. food insecurity? Um, you talk about poverty, and you have um, if, if we got to we got to learn how to make it harder to turn violent thoughts into violence make so they can't turn violent thoughts into violence 
And so that's something that Alvin probably could talk more about. Since she sees our residential psychology, <laughs> <laughs> but, but but you know, and so and so we have to address it. This is no different than having a cancer. Yeah. You know, and so and, and so when I when I and we can't make this like it's normal. We can't normalize gun violence. Mm-hmm. You know, we yeah. have to be proactive with that. And I will say this: and um, last August the NAACP, all of our branches met with all of the city managers and police chiefs to talk about this. Mm-hmm. And our recommendations was to pay the people on the ground that's doing the work. Hello. Yeah. Pay, give them the AR money, and the AR money, give them a percentage of that that's doing the work, teach them to become 501c3s, and teach them to be sustainable. Because they're using their own money, and they're in these neighborhoods and working with these young people, and, and, and they're doing using their own money. And they keep popping up when we have violence, and then they go away because mm-hmm. they go broke. We need, mm-hmm. to, we need to use these organizations that are these grassroots organizations. I'm not talking about big name folks. I'm talking about grassroots organizations that is doing the work. Mm-hmm. Don, let me get your reaction to the latest shooting. And not only that, you know, we, we talk about Norfolk State because it is right here in our backyard. Mm-hmm. But Memphis last night had a gunman who went around and shot four people um, in, di- in eight different areas across the city and where they have literally had to shut down the city of Memphis um, last night. Um, someone else was shot in this area. I mean, it just seems like it keeps happening. Well, it can continue to happen as long as we have all these guns out here and as long as we have individuals who are not stable and we have individuals who don't care about anyone else's life except their own. And so how do you change that? How do you work with that? Yeah. You know, you have we have to make sure, one, because I do want to, you know, talk about the, I call them the children, but the young adults. Mm-hmm. We all remember when we went to parties when we were in oh, school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me started. We went to plenty of house parties. Yeah. It was a part of, of culture, yeah. the culture. And this is in PWIs and ours. Everybody, right. everybody, everybody does this. Everybody, yeah. everybody does yeah. this. Mm-hmm. The difference being, though, is access to the guns, I think. And then the other part is the mixing of not knowing who you're with. So when... We went to house parties at our time. I knew everybody that was in the house yeah. party because they were a part of the university. Mm. They were not That's people who point. lived at that time in Petersburg or Richmond or whatever coming in because the party was for us. It was for the students. Yeah. So I knew. That wasn't the social media you know, aspect I knew of everybody it where everybody there. comes because right. they just heard about you it. Because they mm-hmm. put it on Twitter and it's a party over here, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. because, you know, yeah. that's just the way it was. But so it is so different now. Mm-hmm. that anybody can be there. And so we, too, have to talk with our young adults and children mm-hmm. about making choices about where they go to that's party. Yeah, that's and a very And in my good point. opinion, we need to make sure that, you know, and this is kind of challenging. The kids won't like it, but we had parties in the old gym on campus. <laughs> yeah. So you had to show you, campus, you had yeah. to show your ID to get into the party, so you were mm-hmm. Norfolk State student mm-hmm. or VSU student, where, which yeah, is where right. I was. Mm-hmm. So we knew who was in the party. We had to provide those opportunities on campus for our kids, so that they don't have to go looking for the party. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. we we have to we you you want to control your surroundings now, and we need our young people to start thinking about that. If you don't know somebody, because you know, nowadays, mm-hmm. if you look at me wrong, well, and that, and, that, and, and where does that that goes to confidence in yourself? So absolutely. we got a lot of that too. And Alvin, I want to come to you about this because you know you study human behavior. Mm-hmm. What? <laughs> why does it feel like? And and tell me if if this feeling is incorrect. But it feels like there's this this rush to violence as opposed to working it out or talking it out or yelling it out or whatever. But the first thing we want to do is pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, what else is happening with our society that we are, are to that point? Well, I'm going to say something very controversial and I'm, I know people are going to feel some type of way about me for what I'm getting ready to say. Okay. I'm just going to tell you in advance. All right. But I do not love our music anymore. Mm. All right. 
Music is so powerful. And while I am not advocating for censorship, I am saying that we do have a responsibility in our community for what it is that we allow to be inside of our music. Now, if we talked about it from a biblical standpoint, we know that biblically, you know, for those of that kind of belief, all right, Mm -hmm. I'm not telling everybody what to believe, but that Lucifer was the angel of music. Okay. And there's an interesting force that comes with music, because if you think about it, you can hear a song that you heard when you were a kid, not know the lyrics if I just asked you what the lyrics of the song are. But as soon as the sound of the music plays, suddenly the lyrics come back to you. Because there's enormous psychological impact connected to music. There's something about the way that it speaks to us that can create and change mood. When we're in a bad mood, we could put on certain music and we start to feel better. When we want to sink into our emotion, we can put on certain kind of music and find ourselves in that saddened emotion if that's where we want to be. If we want to feel romantic, you can put on music and set the mood. Music has enormous psychological impact. Mm -hmm. And because it is so large, you know, in addition, we can get into social media and everything else that's connected to this. Mm -hmm. But even before social media, we were starting to trend more violently. Right. So but the if you watch what has happened in terms of what's in our video games, what's in our music, what's promoted in our media, we glorify violence. And violence is perceived as powerful. And when you feel powerless and other elements of your life, you reach for the status symbols and experiences that give you the pseudo experience of power. So now I'm not going to be the chump. I'm going to be the powerful person inside of this moment, which is also why a lot of the shooters on the street here, mm-hmm. by the time they get to jail with the old heads, they're getting beat up every day. You know why? You never even learned how to fight fist to cuffs. Sure. So you think you're so strong because you can click a trigger. But those dudes who are in jail, they actually had to learn true combat. So this thing that looks like courage to you here means not, they'll eat your lunch in jail. So we are not even having the cross generational conversations to be able to talk about what your choices Mm. really mean and the impact of those choices. We're not talking about how music when we were younger, and I'm not saying there wasn't crime when we were younger, but I'm saying that we spent so much more time as a community of color in particular talking about love. We told Mm -hmm. stories. Some of our best songs were talking about love, how your mama made food, what we were doing (laughs) at such and such. And we would sing those things. And and the reality is that it was part of, because everything has a culture, it was part of the culture to be able to talk about our connectivity. Now it has become part of the culture to talk about why I'll help you see God early. I'll mm. take you to your maker. That's all that's in the culture now. And if we don't think that that's not having psychological impact because of norming effects, we are sadly mistaken about how the mind actually works. And that's why there are movies that are rated G and PG and PG-13 and R, because we recognize that at certain levels, you can't process the messages that are here. And while we can't tell you not to watch it, we are telling you that generally speaking, you need to be over this age to be able to process this thing. But we're not doing that with our babies, being careful about what they're listening to, what they're exposed to, how they're translating this information. And when it feels good to the body to be singing these songs that are so violently laden, Do know that that comes back inside of the moment. And now because women are singing those same kinds of things, Mm -hmm. our girls are even finding power in violence. So if we're not going to be honest about addressing some of the things that we make exciting for the generation that is not even mature enough to process it, and I don't care how mature you try to tell me you are at 18, you're a child. Mm -hmm. And at 25, I'm just barely questioning whether or not you're an adult. Okay, that's that <laughs> remains to be seen. I call you guys baby adults at twenty to twenty five. Okay, so like there it and I and it's not to be disrespectful. I'm not no, insulting your I'm intelligence. Not. I'm saying that you have not have enough had enough, enough life experience. lived experience to recognize that this permanent decision you're getting ready to make is in a temporary situation. 
absolutely. 757-440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation. We're talking about gun violence and what we need to do as a community to change it. Um, We'd love to hear from you today in this conversation. 757-440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. And if you're just joining us, we are talking about gun violence with the Another View Roundtable. Relationship expert Alvian Lyons, political science professor Carol Pretlow, political consultant Galen Conoyton, and Norfolk City Treasurer Don Hester. Um, when, so what do you think, because I know a lot of people, for example, talk about, well, we need to get credible messengers out there. We need to get people who are in the community, from the community, to start to talk to people and to disrupt this violence. Don, is that an effective way to make a change? No. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that was short. You want to expand expand a little bit on that? (laughs) It's not, it, okay, messaging helps. You know, messaging always helps. I didn't mean to be so sarcastic, <laughs> but I did. Uh, we can't keep doing the same thing we've been doing. We've been talking to people. Talking is one thing, but helping me to shape who I am as a person or understand the value of me as a young adult. Mm-hmm. Well, just as a person, period. You don't have to be young because old people, you know, got issues too. But it's it's a whole, if we go back to a culture, we all in our own little space. Mm-hmm. It's, we're not, we're mm-hmm. not, and, and I'm not, I don't want to generalize it to say that it's that way for everybody. Mm-hmm. Because we do have our groups and families and places where we work that help to shape yes. us. Mm-hmm. Well, and so we can't, um, it, it, the message is one thing, but we have to help people to grow and want to love themselves enough to make some right choices and to feel confident in who they are. And so I say, you know, you start with a small circle and work and your way you out. Work your way out. And mm-hmm. you know, I have said this since I was elected in 1996. Yeah. Bring somebody into your fold mm-hmm. who needs some help mm-hmm. and make a lifetime commitment to them until you know they're strong and stable mm-hmm. and able. And then they should pick up one and then you pick up another one. And we keep it going. And then we teach and we show and we love and we help pick you up when you fall. Those are the kinds of things that change a culture. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I'm I'm glad you said that because actually, when I met my first class after the incident, I had nothing. I I it kept me up at night wondering what, how do I talk to these students about this? And when I came in class, I said, okay, I'm going to try to reach them. And then I'm like, wait a minute, let them talk. And when I said to them, I said, obviously, I'm speechless. I don't know what to say. Can you help us as an institution, Norfolk State, not just us as political scientists, but Norfolk State and as the black community get through this? And it's a diverse student because they are Asian Americans, they are Nate, uh, Native Americans, all, and they came up with some excellent ideas. That's why I told them to call in today to share. <laughs> Can you give us one? And then we're going to go to the phones because they have phone and lines. One lit of up. them started out, it, said, it starts with the classroom itself and the marriage between the classroom, the community, and the family. And instead of saying, this is what we're going to do on Norfolk State's campus, da da da, and we're going to have a memorial service, which we will. And and then your friends get together with you. They said, 
our parents need to be here for this conversation. And I said, yeah, but a lot of you don't live in this area. And they told me, and in fact, um, tomorrow's class, if you're listening, you have some <laughs> ideas and we're going to share them and we're going to share them with the community. They said it's important not just to isolate ourselves as intellectuals, but to see, give these ideas to the community, to take our perspectives, write them, show pictures, and share them with uh, associated elements in the community, the NAACP, the Urban League, the City Council, and this was important. They said it's important for City Council and people who are politicians not just to come to us on an election time or when there's a crisis because their feeling was, yeah, this is important and this is heartbreaking, but... Two months from now, they will have forgotten us. Don't let them forget us. Mm. <laughs> Gaylene, let me get a response from you, and then we're going to go to the, our phone lines are lit up. So I'm going to take okay, some calls. Okay, I just, I just, I just want to make a couple of quick points, and sure. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it by my son, he will be 25 October 16th, but I'm only like 22. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> me too, Gaylene. To me too. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want you to know. With my son, I created boundaries with his music. Mm -hmm. You know, he would and and he would not play any music with any uh, mm -hmm. profanity in it. He would be afraid. <laughs> and I caught him one time, and he was he was horrified that I heard it. Mm -hmm. Right. So now, you know, his his music is different. He doesn't listen to really hardcore music, but he doesn't go to parties either. His generation, they go to restaurants, they go to brunch. Mm -hmm. You know, they go they 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 do different things. Because they don't feel comfortable going to parties anymore. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they never really, even when he was in high school, he really didn't go to that many parties. But they really do things on the outside because they are afraid to really go to parties. They'd rather go to a nice restaurant or, you know, go to a, uh, go to a museum where they have wine or something like that. You know, and I, mm -hmm. and I say that, of course, it's going to be happy hour because they don't have no money. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but my point, they try to do low budget things. He's in grad school, so they're doing low budget things. But my point is that it also it, it's also look at, you know, you have babies having babies. If mm -hmm. parents have uh, use of profanity or listen to profanity with their um, music, with their kids, of course, it's going to it's going to generate down to them and, 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 it, and it carries on to the next to the next level. Mm -hmm. So that's what mm -hmm. I wanted to say. Okay, let's go, go to our phone lines because our phones are lit up. Don joins us from Hampton. Hi, Don. You're on the air. Uh, Jaylene, I grew up with Nathan Watt. Now, okay. Mm -hmm. And can, I, I, the 50th anniversary of Superfly occurred a couple of months ago. And I heard <laughs> the co-star, which I cannot remember her name, take offense to the fact that... Um, there was an educator that referred to those films as black exploitation films. And she I felt like that. that was an affront to, you know, the, the work that she's done. But let me say this. I remember sitting in the cinema house at 15 and 16 and watching those films. And because of the influence in my home, because, you know, most of us at that age had a mama and daddy in the house. Might have been 75% of them. But the point was, I, I just remember saying I'd never be able to get away with that stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. I, I'd be taken out by one of my parents <laughs> instead of uh, someone on the street. So my, my question is, those are the influences that I remember. Some of the guys that I grew up with were not strong enough to repel that kind of thinking. And they said, that's going to be uh, my job title. I, know what I'm going to do as a profession, and that is I'm going to be a criminal. Now, I heard someone talking about house parties. And back in the 70s, we would go in and out of – I was in house parties that, that I didn't necessarily know the host. But it was just an attitude that you bring a refreshment. We knew where the party zones were in Hampton. You knew where to go, okay. where you could party. Don, Don, I'm going to move you along because we got so many calls to get to, but I get your point. Oh, he hung up. <laughs> I didn't mean for him to hang up. But <laughs> Let's talk to Mark in Norfolk. Hi, Mark. You're on the air. Yeah, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm agreeing with all of you. Uh, Ms. Lyons, I'm, I'm really in your camp uh, as it relates to what you said. 
Mm-hmm. But then that ties into who's going to enforce that policy right. of what they intake and what they listen to, number one. Mm-hmm. And then Mrs. Hester, I agree with her. She said that we're doing our own thing. And I just like to broaden that out and bluntly call it we live in our own silos. Yeah. So mm-hmm. now while we're living in our own silos, these children who are now becoming more homeless because Big Mama and Great Granddad and Granddaddy, they're dying. So, like, right here in Norfolk, we're experiencing the highest homeless rate of students in, in, in public school. And so I think what our children are telling us, they're communicating through gun violence. And their saying is that you left us behind. We're in those silos. And we don't see them. And when we think that we do these little one-off tutoring sessions and all of that, and we think we feel good about what we have done, right. mm-hmm. but it meant absolutely nothing to them. Yep. So yep. until we're ready to get gritty and get dirty and realize that, yeah, somebody did have that child and that they are responsible. But the fact of the matter, we're responsible. Mm-hmm. So okay. that means going over and beyond and doing the things that's going to make us uncomfortable to make these people feel more comfortable to stop what we don't like. Thank you, Mark, for the call. We really appreciate that. You know, I, I know that because it was a Norfolk State student or if it happens at ODU or if it happens at Christopher Newport or any of the schools, Hampton University, um, we we pay attention because it's a college student. Right, because it's not but, supposed to happen to those kids. Exactly. Right. But but the fact of the matter is it is happening to everybody right. across the board in terms of, of this violence. I'm wondering for you ladies, have you changed your um, perspective or your ways of doing things in light of this. I'll give you an example. Um, the other night I was coming from an appointment and it was dark because, you know, it's getting darker earlier now. <laughs> and for the first time that I could really remember, I literally was watching everything. Your head was on you know, a swivel. My head was on a swivel. I, I did not pull up next to the car mm-hmm. at the red light. Mm-hmm. You know, I purposely stopped a few feet back. I mean, I've never reacted like that before. And so, Alvin, let me get your... Are you changing anything in terms of maintaining your own safety? So, uh, as a woman... We're, we tend to be a little more cognizant of the things that are happening around us, you know, not calling us weak creatures, but just the fact that sometimes we can be more vulnerable Mm -hmm. based on whomever that criminal may be and what their intentions may be. Um, The, the thing that has changed a little bit for me is that um, I've raised a couple of children that were not my own just for, you know, the record. And I'm not talking about, I've, uh, I have adopted children, but I also have other children Mm -hmm. that were not ours that, came from very difficult home situations. And to Mark's point, you've got to be prepared to get your hands really dirty. And the fact is most folks only want to get a little dust on their hands. They don't want to get dirty. And to really change a life, you actually have to be willing to get involved in that life. And that that what we used to consider mentorship, where you show up for all kinds of things, some of these babies have to be re-raised, okay? And mm-hmm. by the time, and when you meet them, they don't come in cute little adorable, because everybody loves them when they're cute. It's when they get to <laughs> old enough to have mm-hmm. opinions, a huge mouth, and have no idea what they're talking about. That's when they actually need you the most. So I used to raise teenagers and I have you know, people that call me mom mm-hmm. and we're only 10 years apart. OK, mm-hmm. like but at the time that I met them, I was in my 20s already married because, as we said, I got married young and they were in their teens. But their parents were in and out of jail and having all kinds of issues. So I told my husband, you build me a five bedroom house. I'm bringing home some other people's babies. <laughs> and he's come to discover that I was not joking. OK, <laughs> like, so we like I said, we've raised a few. What has changed, though, is I didn't used to be as particular about who we brought home. Mm-hmm. I, di- I wasn't worried about that before because to me they were all just babies but the more violent things have become the more cautious I have to be about who I bring home now and what I don't like about that fact is it's a double-edged sword yes it may make my house more comfortable in the immediate but the consequence of one more adult who's being cautious with one more young person means more distance between mm-hmm. us and solution and so I I am noticing that change and it's try it's hard to figure out 
How do you cl- safely close that gap without it impacting your own household in very negative ways? That has been challenging for me. And then the last thing that I'll say very briefly mm-hmm. is as these crimes happen and the more I understand about law enforcement, there's a nervousness that some of us who are living very upstanding lives and have brown children, when you're bringing these children who are coming from difficult situations into your home, if they do something wrong, your children are also implicated now. So I, your home address is now their address. If they do something your home is also mm-hmm. one of the places they're coming to check. And those kinds of things make stuff more complicated. I just don't like the fact that I have to think twice mm-hmm. now about things that I really didn't think didn't twice think about, about before. before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What about you, Don? Have you changed anything about the way you function in society based on what's been happening? I did the driving thing, too. But I do it in daytime and night. Yeah, mm-hmm. All you, the you know, time. Because yeah, you're right. It doesn't have to happen it at the dark. That's anytime. true. That's you know? very true. Yeah. That is very true. Let's go to Kenny in Norfolk. Hi, Kenny. You're on the air. Hey, how are you all today? Okay. How you doing? I'm well. I, you know, I've noticed uh, that I think what's coming to fruition is years of lack of education. And it seems like no one wants to have accountability for their actions any longer. We have a a divide within our own community. Yeah, we're sitting here and we are trying to figure out solutions. But the people standing in front of the tiny giant, they're not listening to NPR. Mm. They're not in church. Mm. They're not reading books. They're not interested in a mentorship. Their parents don't know anything. Uh, Violence is a response of a small mind trying to express itself. Mm. And because we spent years not investing in education, now we're seeing what happens when a bunch of small minds try to express themselves. So, yeah, a, a nice, you know, Norfolk State student could try to have a conversation with someone else, but that someone else is going to reach for violence because they have no communication skills. And they have no accountability because their parents are going to say, oh, my kid's an angel. He would never do anything like that. But it seems like a lot of angels are demons when they get out of their home. <laughs> okay, Kenny, let's take a response from our from our panelists. Dawn? <laughs> I just wanted to say, and, and Kenny, um, I do thank you for, for that. And I do, um, um, I'm not going to say that I agree, but I do feel that um, education and how it is administered to our young people, especially in the public school system, must change. Mm-hmm. We're still trying to to do things the same way. And yes, I agree that for some students, it is not working. But for the majority of the students in public schools, they are receiving an education. And I would say that for those who may be not receiving all that we want them to have, it is because of other forces that are impacting their lives, whether it's what's happening at home, whether they're getting, you know, support or not, whether their parents are available or they're working for jobs or what have you. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to say that it's just education because it's you can be knowledgeable and still be have issues. You can have mental health issues and you can still pick up an AR-15 and go take out somebody. So, I, 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 you know, I, I want to keep that in, in, per, in perspective. The people who are hanging out at the tiny giants and on the corners asking us for money, y'all stop giving them money. They need to go get some help or they need to go get a job. So don't give them any money. Give them some water, something to eat, and make sure they clean it up and don't leave trash around. And that's totally <laughs> off the subject, but I just went there. <laughs> you just wanted to get that point yeah, in. I there. just went there. Um, I'll stop right there and come Albion. back. <laughs> to, to, to couple with Dawn's point about education and even Kenny's, I think that in addition to what the feeling that there's not enough education and the ways in which we're doing education, we've defunded a lot of the things that allow students who are not naturally academic to be able to build careers of value. 
And when we make it so that the only kids we value are the ones who can do trig and calculus at 14, and then I don't fit into that, I'm looking for what other thing there is. And unfortunately, that other thing is rarely a positive thing. We stopped investing in orchestra and music programs. So now you've got these very small, narrow lanes in which you can be one of those people. But the le- the the road to heck, okay, I won't say the other <laughs> word, the road to heck is broad. Okay, Mm -hmm. so if we make heaven this teeny little lane in terms of accomplishments and success, but we make that path where that pathway to Hades, a broad lane, where do you think our kids are going to end up? So we need to change how we are, what we are divesting and investing in relative to education so it could be more inclusive to the non-traditional learner so that everyone walking out of school can actually have a way of being able to make money, be a positive contributor to our society without having to fit in to your your, you know, stuffy image of what this thing really is supposed to be. Kayleen, when you hear people say, well, you know, organizations like the NAACP and the Urban League and others should be doing more. What's your reaction to that? Do you do you take that on as a as as a fair criticism? Well, as a leader in both organizations, the Urban League has, has a ton of programs because they are a uh, they are a organization that have programs. The bigger part of it is access to um, um, to get to the grassroots, and they do that, but it, it needs to be even at a wider lens. And they're, and and they're they're doing tremendous things right now with the NAACP. We do the advocacy and the legislative piece. You know, of course, we handle we you know civil rights and all of that as well too. Mm-hmm. But let me just say this: <clears throat> as a single mother, I had to really get out and learn what was available for my son to put him in a leadership. Um, programs mm-hmm. and different types of programs. The average parent doesn't have that access to mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. You know, and my son was in every leadership program ever since he was four Little. years old, mm-hmm. and he's an Eagle mm-hmm. Scout. And so I have a page, baseball Facebook page, is called Single Mothers Matter, and I put up information up there. You know, different um, opportunities, summer school programs, leadership programs. You know, that are free. Mm-hmm. You know, that are free. And so when we talk about um, that person on the corner who don't know any better and the parents don't know any better, because no one's talking to them and telling about these programs that are available for their kids or even for themselves. The Urban League has a lot of programs, and they are getting out into the community now and doing, and doing a lot. But we need more of it. We need, that's why I said we need to fund these grassroots organizations that can get out here and work with these, um, work with these families like one-on-one. But there is a lot of programs out here that the average parent doesn't know about. But but doesn't it? Uh, it also comes down to though both sides making the move forward because we can We always say, well, we have to go into the community. We have to go to them, you know. But it's also what I hear you saying, Gaylene, is that there is a responsibility on the parent side or on the other side too to go search for those opportunities. But is a lot right? of them don't even know, so don't search. They ask around. I've talked to some, probably some educated folks that still didn't know some how to how to look and where to go and to where get to, go. to those information. And and that's why I've taken it on as my responsibility to let as many people know what's out here, you know, as possible to let them know what programs are out here, what's um, what's available to them. I mean, it's a two way street, of course. But mm-hmm. I'm just gonna. But on, a, I remember when I was a single parent, I had searched. I did do some searching, but I had to have some people come and tell me. I was fortunate to have people that was in my life that was able to guide me. Yeah. But I know that we everybody didn't have that. I want to hurry and get to Tashara. I hope I'm saying that correctly, who's a student of Dr. Pretlow's. Go ahead, oh. Tashara. You're in the air. Hi. Um, I was just calling. You know, I wanted to call and say how we need more police presence, you know, on the North State campus and at different parties in the area. Um we need more parties organized by Norfolk State where student IDs are required. And at this point, we need metal detectors entering every building. We don't feel safe and there's no accountability. Um, we're tired of losing our classmates and then having to move on. And then it happens all over again. We're honestly so traumatized. Traumatized. Mm. Are you from this area, Tashara? Yeah. You are. Okay. All right, uh, Carol. Well, I'm proud of you, Tishon, and I'm proud of the class for some of the solutions they came up with. And one is the mentorship of 
college students, whether they're seniors mentoring a freshman or whether they're a freshman mentoring a high school. I think that's important, all of that. But now on a political level, I think that the legislatures, the state legislature, the governor and the state legislators need to take control of the situation now. It's no longer a talking point. It's no longer about whether critical race theory and all that. What it is important is to look at gun laws and to revise to meet the 21st century. Now, the gun laws that are in place, they might have been great back in my early generation, but right now they ain't working. And I'm well, sorry, and then, but they Don, not. go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add to that because, you know, I, I don't think I've ever been on the show where I didn't say vote. Mm-hmm. So vote. <laughs> you have to vote for people who will put in legislation that will impact your lives in a better way. Exactly. And, you know, we don't always see that initially, initially and that's at all levels, federal, state, and local we have to vet candidates and put people in office and get legislation passed and then make sure that that legislation is working. Mm-hmm. And so it's, you know, it's, it's multifaceted. There's not one size fits all to it. No. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I, I also wanted to comment on the, I'm glad that your student called Tashana, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tashara. Tashara. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you, Tashara. Um, um, for your greatness as a queen. Um, But I also want to say police presence is challenging when you don't have enough of them. That's just to do the job that they should do. So we don't have enough police officers. We don't have enough Mm -hmm. teachers in the school system. Mm -hmm. People aren't going into the profession. I would, you know, as a police person, if I were thinking about the career, I'd be afraid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because you don't know. And so as an educator, I want to love what I do going to work. And most educators do, but they're getting tired or sooner or they're just not choosing it. So we, too, as a society, as a culture, black community, we've got to shore up our teachers and shore up our police officers and let them know we do value them. And y'all, everybody got something wrong. You know, me as a treasurer, I do something wrong sometimes. And you got to apologize for it. But still... We have to lift us up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have to value who we are as individuals also in this. We got two minutes left in this hour. I mean, this hour just flew by. <laughs> but but, but the I, mean, I, lit up, I so. wanted to, get to come to you finally um, because it, we can't, the community can't wait anymore mm-hmm. for politicians or for mm-hmm. others to do it. Mm-hmm. We've got to do some something. A hundred percent. And that's the, and I think that that's really a very powerful point to end with because we're only going to get as far as we're willing to do the work to get right. And for as long as, cause we talk about power and powerlessness for as long as we are waiting for them, whoever the them is to do something, we remain in a position of powerlessness So it's really about what can we do with what we have right now where we are. And the one thing that every one of us could do Mm -hmm. is to actually work on closing the gap between humans. We are in a society right now that technology has allowed for greater and greater gap. Now we have the illusion of connectivity, but because of technology, I could send you Mm -hmm. a text instead of making a phone call. But what I lose inside of sending you a text instead of making a phone call is the ability to communicate effectively with another individual. Mm -hmm. Every time we Mm -hmm. use technology to replace real human connection, we are reducing the value that we will place on one another. So if we so want, we don't even see each other as people anymore because you're just you're mm-hmm. you're just the t- number in my phone now. Right. You right. know, like so everything is every time we do that, we are we are creating greater and greater distance. And the law, lo- the further the distance, the easier the de- easier the devalue. So if we want to change value, you've got to come up close. That's why they say it's hard to hate someone up close. We've got to start to get closer with one another so that mm-hmm. we can see our brother as our own and realize it's not their problem, it's ours. Well, ladies, we are out of time. Thank you so very, very much. I really do appreciate all of this. You know what, folks? We are at a point now where we can no longer shake our heads and say, that's just too bad. When we hear about gun violence, we're losing our young people 
It's got to stop. So share the show chock full of ideas on ways to stop the violence with your friends and family. Go to anotherviewradio.org and download the podcast. Next week on Another View, two things happening. One, we're going to be talking about the plight of African-American farmers, but we also are going to be asking you for your support because it is fundraising time again. (laughs) So plan on joining us next week. Our theme music is an original composition created especially for Another View by Jay Senate. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. And Dr. Barry Graham answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a fantastic weekend, everyone. And let's get together again next Thursday at noon for another view. Support comes from Thomas Nelson Community College, now becoming Virginia Peninsula Community College, the first choice, whether starting your bachelor's degree or advancing your career. More at tncc.edu. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever, whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org.